Okay, um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit, but you'll end up seeing that this is actually related. Um, but we're going to talk about pollination, and I'm just very briefly, just in case some of you don't know about the importance of pollination, I'll just cover a little bit about it, the basics, and then we'll just jump in to how we might model this ecosystem service. So remember, it's an ecosystem service. It's an important one. 90% of, of flowering plants rely on animal pollinators for fertilization, and more than 200 species um, act as pollinators, um, but, and, and, and so you can have hummingbirds, bats, small mammals that pollinate um, these flowers, um, but the majority of the pollination occurs um, by insects, beetles, bees, ants, butterflies, moths, wasps, uh, flies, um, but for the crops that we like to eat, the main pollinators are um, bees, both wild bees and managed bees. So managed bees are, are um, those that humans um, give a home to, i.e. we um, put them in these boxes and um, we uh, can provide them with food but we might move them around. So they don't have nesting needs because the human provides the nest in the form of the box. And you can have honeybees, they're domesticated. You can also have bumblebees um, that are managed bees. Um, but wild bees um, do a lot of pollination for free, for real, right? Uh, the managed bees, there's a, there's a uh, management cost associated with those. Um, and both of these um, play an integral role in, um, in crop pollination. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of slides, but I will give them to you, and most of the stuff's written. So, um, and you can ask me at any time um, about uh, these, these topics. Uh, this, although this slide is cool. So um, this is from somebody else, but on the left you see if, if um, we only had wind pollination available, that's what your breakfast would look like. On the right this is um, with pollinators. Um, you obviously, you know, we want to conserve pollinators um, as much as possible. Um, and because there's an increased demand in pollinated crops, um, we also need essentially more bees around, both wild bees and, um, and honeybees. Uh, and so I'm going to skip all this. Lots of pressures on honeybees and wild bees. Um, this is kind of like the summary. Um, you know, so they're, they're afflicted by parasites and pathogens. We're dosing them with insecticides. Even herbicides have been found. The glyphosate has been found to affect the gut microbes of bees and, um, and, and makes them more susceptible to diseases. So even things that we've been told, no, nah, this is okay, um, are, we're finding that that um, is, is basically affecting their health. Um, there's a loss of forage, i.e. what they feed on, and a loss of habitat, i.e. where they nest. Um, through land use, land cover changes, we've, we've modified those things um, and they have less places to nest and eat. Um, for honeybees, you've got a lot of travel stress in the U.S. They're carded across the entire U.S. and back. Um, there's also a lack of knowledge about bees and a decreased interest in beekeeping in the U.S. that, that has led to um, fewer um, people having bees in their backyard. Um, and climate change is also affecting the ranges of um, wild bees. And all those things are impacting the bee. It's the, the you know, quintessential complex system. <laughs> And, okay, so what we, what we want to do, and so first I'll go through it, um, you know, theoretically basically, and, and then we're going to do it in lab, um, is how can we um, model the ecosystem service of pollination? Well, we're going to use a tool um, that's called the Crop Pollination Module of INVEST. INVEST is a suite of ecosystem service modeling tools developed by Stanford 
World Wildlife Fund, Nature Conservancy, and the University of Minnesota's um, Center on the Environment or something like that, Institute on the Environment. So it's a partnership between two um, prestigious U.S. universities and two rather large and you know accepted um, non-governmental organizations um, to try and give uh, policymakers and um, these NGOs uh, tools to map. Um, and quantify ecosystem services. We're going to be using one of those tools today, that's the crop pollination module, but when you downloaded this yesterday, or two days, whenever we did that, um, you actually got all of their um, tools, and I've got links to the online help and in the online help, they even have examples and stuff. So if you, if you Google the Natural Capital Project and you're like, oh, these other tools look cool and I would want to use them, um, you, you can um, in, investigate on your own how they work. But they try and make it really friendly. They even have um, uh, sample data for you. Um, so we'll just be using the, um, the pollination service one. In a sense, we're trying to map this ecosystem service. What we need, it, it requires a certain number of inputs. The first input is a land use, land cover raster of the area. So um, you've been hearing a lot about those, but here you go. Now the land use, land cover raster should have a spatial resolution that is fine enough to, mod, to um, capture the movement of bees in your area. So if you have a land use land cover raster that's at one kilometer spatial resolution and the majority of the bees in your area are small bodied bees that only travel 50, 100 meters, you can't use this tool, okay? Um, it just won't capture those bee movements. But if you are modeling, uh, you know, honeybees and bumblebees, they'll travel 1.5, 2.5, 5 kilometers easily. And so that would be okay. A one kilometer spatial resolution raster would be okay. So you do need to know something about um, the bees in your area before um, going on this adventure. Uh, but typically, you know, you. You can find, uh, you know, with, with MODIS, you have 250 meters, um, which won't capture the absolute smallest bees in your area, but it should capture um, some. And all this does is it, and I'm gonna like, this is kind of like the outline of what we're doing, um, and then I'll have picture examples, okay? So just hang on, if I'm going too fast here, um, I'll have picture examples. So step, in step two, you're um, mapping the, the suitability of all of your land use, land cover classes as nesting sites. So you're just transforming that landscape into how bee friendly um, are these land covers as nest sites for my wild bees. And if you have multiple guilds or groups of bees, then you can do that step for each guild. The third step is related. You do exactly the same thing. You rate every land cover in terms of how suitable is it in terms of floral resources. So I have a water land cover. Does it provide me any floral resources? No. So I would essentially reclass it as a zero. And then I'll have other land covers, like a field of sunflower. Bees love sunflower. So if I have sunflower as one of my land covers, I'd be like, oh, that's a one, right? I'm rating it as my top land cover um, to provide um, floral resources, excuse me, in that landscape. Now this one, there's a bit of a twist because you're integrating the, that, those floral resources over what you think is what you put in as um, the typical foraging range for each of your gills. Now you could do this for all species, but it would take forever. So usually you'll either you know map it by gills or, or just some general bee that represents all bees in your area. But you pick a foraging radius, and what it does is remember to this morning when we talked about these zones within which we were calculating means? 
Well, you can calculate the mean foraging around each pixel. Your neighborhood, right, is no longer a three by three. It's something that has biological meaning in, and it just looks in that, you know, maybe you say my bees in my areas on average have a 700 meter foraging range. So for each pixel, it'll look at a 700 meter radius and it could do the average of all of those. But it takes it one step further. Does that make sense so far? It takes it one step further in, in that it adds basically a distance weighted calculation to that kernel. So it's saying weigh the pixels that are closer to my center cells more than the pixels at the outer edges of this radius. Because there's a cost to the bee to go like 1.5 kilometers out, find flowers, come back. That's an energetically expensive. And it's, you know, if there are floral resources closer, even if they're rated the same, even if I have sunflowers closer and sunflowers further away, I should discount the fact that the bee has to travel so far. So it's not doing just a straight up mean, it's basically, Within all those pixels, it's applying this distance weighted function and saying everything that's closer to my center cell, give it a higher weight than everything that's further away. So that's that integration over a particular foraging radius. Um, and then the, the last step is basically, it's, it's, it's just multiplying these um, so that you get an, a score or an index from zero to one about how um, strong you would expect the pollination service to be in that um, landscape. Now it's not technically pollination, right? Pollination is a transfer of pollen from, you know, um, within the flower, from one flower to another flower. So what we're measuring is a proxy for, you know, something that approximates um, this pollination service because we're uh, essentially modeling bee abundance in this landscape. Um, and so this is just a little example. So I've got my, um, I've got my, yeah, I've got my uh, landscape here and I have some cropland and I have a happy bee here. Um, this happens to be farmland, this happens to be wildland. And that at that particular center pixel, um, I, this bee uh, might find nesting places here, but maybe they, she doesn't find um, um, uh, floral resources. Um, so, so she's going to have to, so each of these land covers first is going to be rated in terms of, of, of nesting resources. But once you do that, she, you have to look at where she's going in space. So um, at the local level, you're rating every one of these land covers in terms of how suitable they are for nesting and how suitable they are for um, floral resources. And then at the landscape level, you're um, doing that, you know, distance weighted mean of the, the, the forage availability within the foraging radius, that distance that a bee in that area will typically fly. So you're aggregating over the landscape those floral resources. So your bee, you know, maybe it only, maybe this bee only flies this far. And maybe the other bee, you know, your other guild, maybe it flies further. It would have access to resources in here that that first bee wouldn't. Um, so that might be two different guilds if you're doing separate guilds. Um, let me run through two examples of this to make this a little bit more concrete. So this is Yolo County, um, California. It's one of the counties in the U.S. that, that um, produces many uh, watermelon, which, um, you know, hopefully you all like to eat. Um, and it, you can see it's a highly agricultural um, landscape. So yellow is cropland, you've got some grassland, you, and then you, uh, on the um, west here, you have some oak and, and uh, remnant quote unquote natural uh, land covers. So more natural over here, more crops over here, um, and this happened to be the uh, land use land cover class that they were using. So what they do is you just rank 
from zero to one, the suitability of each of those land cover types to provide nesting. And here they did four guilds. Uh, and this is work by Eric Lonsdorf and his colleagues. Um, so they had the stem, the, the, the bees that, a group of bees that like to nest in um, stems of trees. They had a group of bees that like to nest in cavities. Um, so little holes in rock piles or little holes in, in um, trees, things like that. They had a guild of bees that like to be in um, the forest, nest in the forest. And they, they had a group of bees that like to nest in the ground. And so the color from red to green, red is basically they're saying there are no nesting sites um, that are suitable in everything that was essentially agriculture. It's just too disturbed, you wouldn't find any nesting. There are the cavity nesters, again, like not much out here, a little bit here, lots in the places that had the tree and the chaparral uh, lane cover. And same thing for wood, it makes sense, right? It's where there are, you know, woody uh, vegetation. And then the ground nesters, they are able to nest some, you know, they get a score of 0 0.25. Um, so not bad. Um, it's not ideal. It's not like a bare patch of dirt that's undisturbed because, I mean, you are going to have truck, you know, agricultural equipment running over it. Um, but, but they can um, build nests there. You do the exact same thing for floral resources. For each guild, you're going to rate um, how much, for, sorry, for each land cover, you're going to rate how much that particular land cover can provide in floral resources on a scale of zero to one. And then you're gonna apply that, is, that smoothing function. And that's why these look so much smoother, right? You've got that radius within which you're aggregating all of the floral resources and, and accounting for distance from the center cell. These are done through focal statistics. It's a mean and you're Add, you're multiplying a kernel that's your, that's your weighted distance. Um, and so in this case, they did three seasons. Floral, se floral um, blooming of flowers can change by season, especially in our area. So they have a spring season, a summer season, and a fall. And each land cover was rated um, um, separately. And so everything that's in red is, uh, does not provide floral resources in spring, summer, or fall. Everything that's in green provides floral resources um, in um, those seasons. And then the last step is just to multiply. So the, the, the guilds, the, the nesting by the, by the um, floral resource, you know, your, your smoothing function of the floral resources. And in this, and here they're showing it just applied to the farms in the area. And so the places that have the green still are places where you would expect um, lots of wild bees to be pollinating these watermelon farms. Um, and the places where you have red are places where you probably want to bring in um, honeybee hives so that you get fruit, right? Without that process, you're not gonna get the watermelon fruit. So you're gonna need some, according to the model, you're gonna need some sort of um, way to pollinate those fruit. Now, 